Acts, Acts chapter 15 this morning. Acts chapter 15. One of the things I want you to think about this morning is discerning the will of God with a heart willing to obey. If you take notes, you can write that down. Discerning the will of God with a heart willing to obey. Several weeks ago, we talked about how we can hear from God and the different voices that he speaks to us in and how he works. And, um, and this is a little different because as you, as you walk through the story, you're going to see how, um, how Paul... How he works through what God is trying to do in his life. And that's, I think that's the key for us as well too. Discerning the will of God with a heart willing to obey. And <clears throat> I can remember being about Stone's age, 15 years old. And um, my youth pastor at the time was sharing a message and he was speaking to us about how we can determine God's will for our life. And I thought that was pretty good. And he gave us a book because there's a lot of books out there about how to determine God's will for your life. And as I was reading through the book... I understood what he was saying. What the book was saying was that at, in order to get God's will, you really have to start with the first things first. You have to lay down your life and give it to him. You have to move over off the throne of your life and allow him to be on the throne of your life. And when I was 15 years old, I, I, I clearly said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that in my life. Um, I, I see a lot of potential for having a lot of fun right now. And I think God's going to get in the way. And apparently I made that known to my dad. My dad was, he was a, um, one of the leaders at a Plymouth Brethren Church that had a whole lot of different preachers. They would have five or six preachers. And every week you had a new, new speaker. And the, the lead of that church, the lead pastor of that church, he never spoke. He never preached. But my dad was part of the rotation. And at that time, as this started to be worked out in my life, my father went ahead and stepped away from the ministry. My dad's now 83 years old and uh, he, what winds his clock and makes him so happy is to go door to door and hand out Gospels of John and share Jesus. And for him to step away from the ministry was a really big deal. For the next nine years, I didn't want anything to do with God. I don't think there's any coincidence. The song you're singing at the end, even when I don't see him, he's working. God was doing a work in my life during the time where my dad decided to step away from the ministry. Um, it was a very difficult, difficult time. But I think what happened during that time is something got birthed. You know, as we, we think about the birth process and we've been thinking about it lately, it's it's very, very difficult. You know, I was there two and a half times when my wife gave birth. Two and a half. I didn't make it through the, the last piece. I, they wheeled me out. It's, you know, you really feel pathetic when you have to do that. I'm going to pass out and I become the patient. She's like, oh my goodness, I'm having the baby here. What's your problem? She could have said that. She didn't. She was nice. She'd never say that. But the, the product that came from the process of childbirth... We have, we have Levi here this morning. Look at him. You see him? You know what? You know, I have the gift of putting him to sleep. So let's see if it works. Let's see if it works today. But that's, that's a very hard situation that you have to go through. And discerning the will of God and being willing to be obedient to what he's asking you to do, chances are it's going to be very difficult. And during that difficult time, you may not see what's being birthed, but God is birthing something very beautiful. This week as Becca was going through what she was going through, I was praying, Lord, what are you going to make out of this? This is upsetting. How are you going to make this beautiful? How are you going to make this awesome? What are you going to do? But he's doing it. He's working. So take the hard time. Take the time of suffering and understand he's not silent. He, he's not just putting you on the shelf. He's working behind the scenes. He's doing his job. And our job is to discern what he's saying. And this is tough. Philip, I think you and I, we always, I don't know, before the sermon, we start talking. And you, have, you always bring up the stuff that we're talking about. It's like God's put it on your heart. But he's doing something behind the scenes. But the key element for us is to be willing to obey in the midst of what he's asking us to do. And that's where we start here. In verse 36, we see the beginning of the second missionary trip for Paul. 
And it all begins with this in verse 36 of Acts 15. This is the New International Version. It says this, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in the towns where we preached the word of the Lord, and let's see how they're doing. So it's a whole different way of going on a mission trip. The previous mission trip, we see that they were worshiping and ministering to the Lord, and while they were doing that, the Lord spoke to them, and he said, Set aside Barnabas, and Saul to the work to which I'm called and to the work to for which I am calling them but here it's like they have a desire they have a they have a want and he says you know what let's let's go back and visit those believers in the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and let's see how they're doing so the emphasis isn't on evangelism and getting out the word of God to the unpre you know the un uh, the unchurched the unbelievers but here it's let's strengthen them that's the thought Let's go. And that's the thought. That's the idea that they had. That's what they wanted to do. Verse 37. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him. And I circled that really big. Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted. And that word deserted or departed, maybe in your translation, means this. He had abandoned them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Paul said, no, Barnabas is doing what Barnabas always does. Barnabas is that encourager. Barnabas is the one who came alongside Saul at the time, you know, Paul. And he put his arm around him. He said, no, this guy's with me. And that's what, that's what Barnabas is doing. I think if, if I'm going to lean somewhere, I'm probably going to lean more towards Barnabas. But here it's pretty clear, I believe, that Paul was being led by the Lord as well too. But we can't tell. It doesn't say it in the text. We're going to have to add that to the text. And here's what he said. Because he had deserted, abandoned them, and Pamphylia had not continued with them in the work, they had such a sharp disagreement. These are the same words used in Acts 15 where they were having arguments and heated debates with the Judaizers. And now it's Barnabas and Saul and they parted company. And from what we understand, from what played out after this, they never got back together. These are two strong believers in the Word of God. And these two jokers never got back together and made it happen again. Have you ever listened to um, oh, Promise Keepers Ministry? When they preach to men, they say, you know, you're always going to need, you're always going to need a Paul in your life. You're going to need a Barnabas in your life. And you're going to need a Timothy. If you guys ever heard that, raise your hand if I'm just... And what that means is you need somebody older in the faith to connect with who can guide you and who can direct you. But you need somebody on the same level where you're going through the same things together spiritually as well. And then you need somebody that you're impacting in your life. It's all about discipleship. <laughs> Did you understand what I just said? Well, what about Paul and Barnabas? The illustration for which that comes from, those two guys couldn't get along. Church history tells us they didn't get back together. Sharp disagreement. And as you look at the way this is handled in the text, it's very difficult. It's, it, you know, you look at it and you think, these guys, these are top shelf. Paul wrote 13 epistles. How can he not make it happen to where they get back together and, and make it work? Well, the one thing that he does say is... In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, he said this, Bring me John Mark because he is profitable. He is useful in the ministry for me. So we see that there was restoration as far as the guy is concerned that they're having a problem with. But think about this. I want you to think about this. What if, what if you're in the Bible times as well too? And Paul comes alongside and said, I don't want that guy. I don't want that. And I don't want him. I don't want him so bad that I'm willing to lose one of my closest friends over my opinion of the fact that I don't want him. What if that was you? What effect would that have in your life? Would it cause you to say, you know, I, I think I, think I got to, I got to, somehow, God, you got to restore my reputation. But who are we talking about? Let's not beat up on John Mark too much. Because John Mark is a lot like us. It, come on, guys. If we, were facing, if we were facing what Paul was having to face, we probably would be like, oh, yep, I'm opting out too. No problem. I'm, I'm not going to do this. Uh, I'm not signing up for that. What happened? He gets stoned in Lystra. He, he gets uh, all kinds of things take place to him. And this is where John Mark, he wasn't there for that. 
He did what? What does it say in the text? He abandoned them. And they came into sharp disagreement. I, I don't know. I, I, I've shared this illustration before in the past, but years ago, one of the six times that I've lost 35 pounds, um, there was an individual. Have you guys done that? You know, six times in your life you lose 35 pounds. That's, that's, that's going at it. Of course, because I'm a preacher, it, I used to say five times. Now, now I say six. But I, I, I walk, and I'm walking back here at school, and the PE instructor, uh, she was here, and she said, hey, you guys know this story? Anybody know this story? Oh, good. She said, you, um, you still playing basketball on Saturday morning? I said, yeah, I am. She said, you, you still working out? Y yeah. Well, why are you asking that question? She said, because you're kind of, kind of letting yourself go. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I need her in my life right now, don't I? Amen. Can I get an amen? But you know what? When, uh, when individuals come like that in my life, and they're that direct sometimes, sometimes God uses it powerfully in my life. I prefer not to have that kind of direct, sharp confrontation. You know, the mirror does that work, doesn't it? Oh, man, no. I'm getting a new mirror. I'm getting a new mirror. But I'm not, I'm not so sure Paul didn't have this reaction in John Mark's life. I think that there was genuine change from Paul being so direct. Because later on in his life, what does he say? Bring to me John Mark. He is profitable. He is useful for me in the ministry. But at this particular time, he's picking his team. Right? He's picking his team. And he says, I'm not going to pick that one. That's tough as a leader. It's tough as a leader to have to discipline, have to come to somebody and say, yeah, you can't be on my team. But he does pick somebody else. It says here, Barnabas took Mark with him to Cyprus. Convenient. Barnabas is from Cyprus. Church history tells us that Barnabas stayed in Cyprus after that. So they went and had their nice vacation. Good American Christians. Stayed in Cyprus. I'm just, I don't know. We, I'm just speaking out of silence. We don't know what they actually did because Scripture turns to Paul and Luke begins to write about Paul and what he did from here on out. Verse 40 is the indicator of that. Paul chose Silas and left commended. Oh, he left commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord Jesus. Now, why did he choose Silas? Look back in verse, you guys, how many of you have your Bibles with you? Look at verse 36 in chapter 15. Listen to what it says. It says of Silas and Judas who went along with Barnabas and Saul back to Antioch to deliver this message. It says this. These guys have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So who are you going to pick on your team? All right, you're picking a team this morning. You've already said, John Mark, not on my team. I'm going to pick this guy. Because when it comes down to it, this guy risks his life for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's like, you know what? I know who I am. I know who my personality is. I'm going to need somebody who's more like, you know, a commando Christian. You know, Navy SEAL missionary. That's who I need because what, a, what is about to happen to me and what did happen to him, that's who he needed. So Paul picks Silas and let's so Captain Kirk picks Spock, right? And here they go and they left and they commended. They were commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say that, that Barnabas and, and John Mark were. And they went through Syria and Cilicia. That's going up north from Antioch. Um, Syria, Antioch, Syria. They went up north a little bit and they began to go west directly. And that's where Syria and Cilicia is. And what did they do? They strengthened the churches. So what's this morning's message all about? Discerning the will of God and with a heart willing to obey what he's asking you to do. So here, their plan was to strengthen these churches. All right. Verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 16 says, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra. And there was a disciple by the name of Timothy living there, and, and whose mother was Jewish. His mother's name was um, Eunice, and his grandmother's name, we find out from the book of 1 Timothy, was Lois as well too. Both of them believers, but his father was not a believer. His father was a Greek. And the believers, and listen to what it says, in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Okay, so what happened in Lystra? What happened to Paul in Lystra? Last week we talked about it. It's not there on the screen. He got stoned. They dragged him out of the city. What happened in Iconium? In Iconium, they wanted to stone him. 
right? They poisoned the minds of the believers there. So my, my question is, you know, as I started this morning, we talked about what God is doing even when I can't see him. He's what? He's working. You should know that by now. Maybe, just maybe, do you think God was working in Timothy's life when Paul was getting stoned in Lystra? I think the answer is quite possibly, yeah, he was. It's, it's, it is no, the two, so Paul is willing to go back to the places where he's hated. They wanted to stone him. Here it is in Lystra. They did stone him there. And he's going back there. He knew he, he, he can't have John Mark. He needed, he needed Silas to go with him. So they spoke well of him. Let's look at Timothy as well too. In Philippians later on, we're going to get to Philippi. Paul's going to go there with Silas. He's going to pick up a couple other guys and here's one of them. Timothy, listen to what it says in the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 20. Speaking of Timothy, Paul said this, I have no one else. I have nobody else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. So when you're picking your team and it's a ministry team, number one, you got to pick that guy who's, you know, he's going to, that's what it means. He risked, Silas risked his neck for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he was willing to do. But who is, who's Timothy here? Timothy has a genuine concern for discipleship and strengthening the brethren. That's who you want on your team. That's who you want to surround yourself with. And Paul says, if I'm going to make it on this ministry journey, those are the type of people that I want. And look around you in the church. When you come to church, is your heart and desire to minister to people. It's hard to seek out people and to start conversations with people that you don't know. And people who are just coming for the first time, it's difficult. We had some problems at the bus stop. Not just the high school bus stop, but the elementary bus stop as well too. So much so that it hit the Facebook Right? There's problems on the bus. There's problems happening. And uh, Facebook in our preserve there, I don't know how many families it hits. I don't know how many members are on that Facebook. Close to like 200 and something. But anyway, you could tell because Friday morning, there's a ton of parents. And they were all walking around like, you know, apparently we need to not just drop them off. Stuff is happening on the bus. So they get onto the bus and I'm listening to the scuttlebutt of the parents and I try to, you know, put my two cents in and kind of have a conversation with one of the guys and he was like, who are you? I'm talking to you. I just kind of walked away and I was like, all right, I tried. You know, maybe next time I'll be a little more rude in his face or whatever. And, Hi, I'm Dave. How are you? Let's be friends. You need Jesus, right? Is that what I need to do? But it's hard. It's hard to meet those people that you don't know. It's hard to begin the discipleship ministry. But Timothy had gone beyond that. And he said, you know what? I have a list of people that I met in Philippi. And I'm very concerned for who they are, how they're growing in Christ. That's where my heart is. That's who you seek out in the ministry when you're putting your team together. So now we have what? We got Kirk. We got Spock. We got Sulu. We got the third member of the group. And they're rolling along. And um, oh, Oh my goodness, look at the rest of verse 3. So Timothy, Paul had Timothy circumcised because he was, because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they knew that his father was a Greek. And as they traveled, verse 4, as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So what's the message that they're sending? What did we talk about last week? They're delivering this message. Listen, you don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to go uh, through the law in order to get saved. So what does he do with Timothy? Timothy had an entry pass, didn't he? You got to be circumcised. <laughs> Why did he do that? Well, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 3, Titus, who's also part of the pastoral epistles as well as, as Timothy, Titus was a Greek and Titus decided the Holy Spirit is not leading me to get circumcised. I'm not going to be circumcised. So what are we talking about here? Why, why is, okay, let's go back to what we went over. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said this. When I'm with the Jews, what am I going to do? I'm going to follow the dietary laws. I'm going to follow the, the, um, the different things that Jews follow so that I can win some of the Jews. But when I'm with the Gentiles... I'm not going to follow all those things. I'm going to be as a Gentile. I will become all things to all people that I might what? That I might win some. And here, Timothy had a, had a tough ticket to get into this particular group. 
But they did what? Look at verse 5. So the churches were what? Say it with me. Strengthened. Say it again. Strengthened. Why did they start this missionary venture? What was the purpose for it? Why are they doing it? He said, we're going to go to back to the churches and we're going to see how they're doing. We're going to strengthen them. And they are accomplishing what they felt like they were supposed to do. Oh, but listen to this. What's the, what did we start with? How did we start the message this morning? Discerning the will of God with a heart willing to obey God in his will. Look at verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia. Sounds like a cold place. Phrygia and Galatia. Having been stopped, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Verse 7. And when they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go there either. So we're going west, we're going west. Let's try to go south. Nope. Let's try to go north. Nope. Come on, I'm Paul. I should be able to determine the will of God for our life. I'm Paul. I'm the guy, right? Uh, so they passed through Mycenae and they went to Troas. And Troas is like the end of the street. You know, we hit the, the Adriatic and sea there that filters into the, the Mediterranean. And they got no place to go. Listen to verse 9. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we. Do you get that? What's that? And after Paul had seen the vision, we. Up to this point through the book of Acts, it's they, 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 they. Who's writing the book of Acts? Luke, very good. Luke is writing the book of Acts. All of a sudden, after Paul had seen the vision, we, who joins them there in Troas? It's Luke. Luke, the doctor. So who do we have now? We got, we got Captain Kirk. We got Spock. Who else do we have? Sulu. Now we got Bones. Now we got the doctor. And let me just tell you this. Paul needed a doctor. He needed a doctor, didn't he? And this particular, he needed him one on the last journey as well too. He's going on this thing. And so here's, he's got his guys. And they concluded that God had called us. Again, us. All of the, now it's first person pronoun. Whereas before it was third person. He, they concluded that us to preach the gospel to them. All of a sudden, the whole flavor, the whole tenure of this particular venture has changed. It was to do what? It was to strengthen the churches. And now he's saying, listen, all right, now we got to give the gospel. Now it's evangelistic. You see, even if you're Paul, you're trying to discern the word, uh, the direction that God wants you to go in your life. And it's not easy, isn't it? It is not easy at all. Walking by faith is, is being submissive to him along the way, listening to his voice and saying, Lord, I honestly don't know. And this comforts me too. If I go through this section, I'm thinking, well, that's, that's more like my life. I'm going to try to go over here. Nope. Try to go over here. Nope. All right. What's this? A, a vision. Where are we going? Oh, I've been... You mean now you're changing the whole, flipping the, the whole script? Yes, I am. Now we're going to go and we're going to share the gospel. The whole thing is going to be changed. All right. So Paul knows what he needs. And he needed a cut man. He needed the doctor from this point on. What's going to happen? Verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight through Somothrace. And the next day we went to Neapolis. And from there, we, there's Luke, he's with them, traveled to Philippi. Now, the Roman colony, and this is the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Now, on the Sabbath, we went outside of the city gates to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and we began to speak to the women who had gathered there. In every particular town, a synagogue would be formed when they had at least 10 believing Jewish men there. That's how, a, that's how a synagogue would be formed. And here in the large city of Philippi, they did not have 10 men who were believers. So Paul, knowing that they didn't have a synagogue, he went where? He went down expecting to find a place of prayer. We sat down, we began to speak to the women that had gathered there. And one of these listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple clothing, clothes. She was a worshiper of God beforehand. 
And the Lord opened her heart, kind of like Cornelius, she was Gentile, opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household who also heard the word of God, they were then baptized after they believed. She invited us to her home. And she said, if you consider me to be a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. It's important to know here too, just as a side note, that God doesn't have any spiritual grandchildren. He only has children. So each individual person, your kids in your house, need to come to a place where they accept Christ as their Savior. doesn't matter, in Timothy's case, if your mother is Eunice and she loves the Lord, and your grandmother Lois, she loves the Lord as well too. Timothy has to come to a place where he says, you know what, I accept Christ as my Savior for my sin. And I need that in my life. And here, that's what happened in Lydia's house. So we had a small church started there. And once... Verse 16, when we were in the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners for fortune telling. And she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting these words, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. Isn't this odd? Isn't this odd that Satan would direct one of his demons to speak out of a woman and to say exactly what she's saying. Well, the same thing kind of happened to Jesus. When Jesus was here, there was a, de- a guy f- filled with a demon who used to come. And what did he do? He would, he would shout out, this is the son of God. Same thing happened to Jesus. I liken this to the fact. Well, let's, let's listen to the rest of the story and then I'll explain it. She kept doing this for many days. And finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and he said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. And at that, mo- at that particular moment, the spirit left her. Well, why did it take Paul many days to come to this conclusion? And it says here that finally Paul became so annoyed, greatly annoyed. And NLT says he became exasperated. The Amplified says he became annoyed and worn out in in being annoyed. And that's what it took to push him over to finally come to the decision that I need to cast this demon out of her. Always be a little suspicious when Satan comes along and pats you on the back. Be suspicious when the world comes alongside you and tries to partner with you. Basically, the message that's being stated here is, you know, you guys ever get lumped in as people of faith with all these other quote-unquote faiths? That bothers me. There's only one faith. There's only one way to Christ. And here, she's saying, you know, I'm a spiritual person. I, I, I'm, I'm spiritually involved and, and Paul's spiritual and, and we're just going to clump this together. We're just going to be spiritual together and I'm going to tell you that I'm kind of like hanging out with him as well. And Paul says, no, there's a delineation. There's a line. She's not with us. Uh-uh. I'm not going to take that promotion from her. But it happened over what? Over many days, finally he came to the conclusion, I've got to make a choice and make a decision. And where did it come from in his life? It says, he got so annoyed. Do you think that was God working in his heart? Let's go back to when he had a sharp disagreement with with Barnabas. (sighs) Folks, God sometimes is working in your heart. And I I think that needed to happen with Barnabas and Saul or Paul. And this needed to happen as well too. He needed to come to the place where he did this. And God's timing is right and perfect. And there's a certain time where this needs to take place. And I think Paul was kind of understanding this has to happen now. And look what takes place. When her owners realized that her hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and they said, these men are Jews. Is that correct? They were more than Jews. They were Christians. This wasn't part of a Jewish group. This was a whole different uh, course that they were on. They were Christians. But more than that, just remember this. We're going to find out later in the text too. They were Roman citizens. So they weren't just Jews. And a lot of people have used that excuse throughout time. These are just Jews, right? We can do whatever we want to the Jewish people, apparently. 
Well, this is another incident of this anti-Semitic type attitude. And they're throwing our city into an uproar. Verse 21, by advocating customs unlawful for us as Romans to accept and to practice. Not true. And the crowd join in in attacking Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Uh-oh. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet into stocks. So what's taking place here? Roman citizens are being bound. Roman citizens are being beaten. And the Jews had a law that they could only hit you 39 times. The Romans, Romans didn't have a law like that. The Romans got done when they were done. And they beat him here in the New King James. It says they laid many blows upon them. Paul knew that they were Roman citizens before this beating. Matter of fact, a couple of chapters later in, 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 uh, in Acts 21 and 22, Paul says, hold on a second. I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do this. But in this situation, Paul didn't say he was a Roman citizen. Do you get what's happening here? Every time he was hit with a rod, don't you think he was thinking to himself, I'm a Roman citizen and this is unlawful. But he took it. Him and Silas both. Two Roman citizens and he's taking the beating. Do you get what's going on here? Well, I think what's going on here is what we started with. He was discerning the will of God for his life. And the will of God for his life is that he was going to suffer. Why was he going to suffer? I don't think he knew at the time. He was going to suffer and he had a heart willing to obey. Again, they were thrown into prison, it says here. And the jailer, the jailer participated at least in some level of the torture that took place because to put your feet into stocks was no happy situation. That was a torture device. Now, what do we have? Countless number of times he's been beaten over the back, him and, him and Silas, and their feet are in stocks. And what takes place? Verse 25. About mid midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Isn't that crazy? These are not American Christians. About midnight. They're singing hymns to God. It sounds like praise, doesn't it? Praise and worship. Singing hymns to God and praying. And all the other prisoners were listening to them. Why were they listening? You know what they were thinking? This is messed up. <laughs> These guys are beaten worse than we're beaten. And they're praising God. And they're singing. And they're happy. This is messed up. They had the attention of all of the prisoners. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't, hey, hey, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, listen to their reply. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. They didn't at this time go into some great dissertation. I don't know. I, you know, I think we can all go through situations and sufferings and different things. But I think it's very hard to see the will of God when we're going through it. It's very hard to stay under that suffering as well, too. Uh, but more than that, it's hard to see, oh, God's doing something behind the scenes. God's going to turn this out for good. He's going to make it in such a way that I'm going to look back and say, ah, that's what you were doing. That's how you were working. That's why you gave me the faith to be obedient to the will that you had for me. I'm just thinking about every, every time he was hit. Was he thinking, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm a Roman citizen. What do you got planned for me? Verse 32 says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all those in the house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household who had heard the message 
were baptized as well. And the jailer brought them into his house and set them a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had believed in God and his whole house had believed as well. When it was daybreak, the magistrates sent this this message and sent officers to the jailer with this order. Release those men, the jailer told Paul. The magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be um, uh, released. Now you can go. Now you can leave. Go in peace. (laughs) Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial even though we were Roman citizens. There it is. And threw us into prison. And now do they want to come and rid us uh, quietly? No! Let them come themselves and escort them out of town. Or escort us out of the prison. Verse 38. The officers reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were greatly afraid. They were alarmed. And they came to appease them. Can't you see them coming to the jail to appease them? All these magistrates. Oh, we're so sorry. We, we didn't know you were Roman citizens. Here, take this fruit basket with you. Come on, it's, it's okay, you know. Please forgive us. Just leave the city now. He requested them to leave the city. And after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, where'd they go? Where'd they go? Look at it. They went to Lydia's house. I think they invited the jailer too. Hey, this is your new church. Jailer, this is where you're going to take your family. No, we're not going outside of the city. We're going to go over. And they met with the brothers and the sisters and encouraged them. Then they left the city. (laughs) Isn't that messed up? Isn't that messed up? Can you imagine God's will for their life? Is that they would take those rods over and over, that beating consistently over and over. For what purpose? For what desire? I honestly think they took that beating for the church at Philippi. This is where Lydia, this is where the church meets. Do you remember these guys? We beat their leaders unlawfully. Don't mess with them. Whenever you bound or beat a Roman citizen without trial, that was was corporal punishment. You were in danger of being put to death for that. Paul said what? It's worth it. (laughs) Lord, I do not know why. You, You... He didn't let me say that I was a Roman citizen so I could get out of this. It was a good thing he had bones with him, wasn't it? Where's my cut man? Right? Spock, can you figure this one out? I don't know. Sulu, can you get us out of here? You take the con, right? God had purpose. Think about the impact. Think about this. Paul wrote of the Philippians and said this, when I was in Thessalonica, no other church gave to me, but you guys did. You guys gave to me not once, but twice. How do you think they felt towards towards Paul? Paul was the reason I believe throughout all of this. We got the jailer getting saved through this. Macedonian call, I believe, encompassed the jailer, encompassed Lydia and the church as well too to protect them in the process. But think about this verse in, in, in Philippians chapter 4. Think about Be anxious for nothing. Hey guys, you remember Paul wrote this. The guy who took that beating for us. But in everything with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I bet you Paul was writing that and thinking about that. He's taking that beating for us. Later on in that chapter, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You took that beating for us, didn't you? Verse 19, but my God, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Imagine the impact of Paul's words to the Philippians after he had done what he did. And all he did was this, all he did was this. He discerned the will of God with the heart willing to obey the will of God. Easier said than done. I'm still thinking about John Mark. That's who I am. I'm John Mark. I'm going to take the vacation trip back home to Cyprus with Barnabas. What's the will of God in your life? 
What is God asking you to do? How is he asking you to move and to work? I, I, I'm very comforted by all of this story it's simply in the sense that Paul was like you and me. He didn't know. He didn't, he didn't have this super spiritual, he, uh, you know, he tried the best he could. He went one direction, no. Went another direction, no. Finally, God speaks to him and says, hey, here's where we're going to go. And oh, by the way, we're going to change the entire trip. And now you're going to share the gospel. Oh, man, I need a cut, man. God supplied all his needs according to his mercy in Christ Jesus. You know, we do this, we do this, this thing called preaching the word of God. And God's word says clearly that in preaching the word of God, that it's not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain. It has great reward. For what? Four weeks now, whenever Stone doesn't have to lift weights, he gets a ride home on the bus. And these two kids, one a senior, and is TJ in middle school or is he in? He's in eighth grade. They get in our car and they, they're real polite, they're real nice, and they go, Can we get a ride? It's all of two blocks away. Can you believe that? Two blocks away. And they need a ride. Man, I hate it when Stone has to lift ways and we can't get no ride. That's not the way Kamari says it. How's it Kamari say it? <laughs> Kamari says it like Alabama. I cannot understand him. So Kamari just sits in the back and he looks at me and he's like, you don't understand me, do you? I understand you, Kamari. I don't understand it. <laughs> Is that the way he says it? <laughs> this past Friday though, huh? I hate him a guy. I love the way he talks. This Friday, though, he's in the car, and I don't know how he brought it up. I don't know how the conversation directed. Oh, who goes to hell and who doesn't? We're talking about that. Right, homosexuals. I said, I don't know. I don't know. Which homosexual are you talking about? It's like, which Catholic are you talking about? How do we know who's going where? I know this one thing, Kamari. That we get to go to heaven by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we accept him as our Savior and Lord in our life. That's how it all starts. Our life can be changed. All of a sudden I hear Kamari in the back seat going, yeah. I said, Kamari, you've, you, have, you go to church? You've been to church? He says, yeah, I, I, I've gone to church. We had Bible study before. TJ, what church do we go to? TJ was like, we don't go to church. What are you talking about? Stop trying to tell a lie. I said, Kamari, you're invited here. Invited here. We'd love to have you. Love to have you. I didn't know it was God's will for me to share the gospel when they got in the car. I know Stone looked at me. He's like, you're happy, aren't you? I got to share the gospel. The next step is to see the fruit. That's God's job though, isn't it? That's God's job. His desire for our hearts and for our lives is to line up with the Holy Spirit. Be obedient to what he's asking us to do. Be willing. Be willing to share a message. You know, I asked you guys last week just to consider sharing. Sharing our service. And Mel, boom. Sunday afternoon. You, you had that YouTube <laughs> up on Sunday afternoon. Of course, it didn't get pushed over into until what Thursday Thursday but I want to encourage you if you guys are a little shy you don't want to maybe necessarily share the gospel hey we heard it this morning share the gospel share our message just push it. wait this is all I did share right okay and maybe I put a little comment next to it Mercy was like dad you should have put a comment right all you got to do is share it's as easy as that Discerning the will of God, God's will for our hearts and our lives and for those around us, His will is that all come to knowledge of the truth. It's got to start somewhere. It's got to start somewhere. Let's all stand together this morning. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we, we trust your word. 
we trust you to do the work and, and I praise you for that. Lord, I thank you for your people, how faithful they are to come out again this week. Lord, what I'm seeing is in your people is they're continuing. They, they have a passion and a love for their church and they're coming faithfully. Lord, I, I, just, I just pray that you would reach through them and through their life into the lives of others who need you. And Father, we ask that you would do this work in their hearts and in their lives to reach others. Father, we praise you that your will is the best thing. It may not look easy. It may not look good at the time. Maybe, just maybe, you're birthing something in our life that we had no idea at the time. Father, we praise you. I ask, Lord, that you would work a mighty work in this place. Father, we thank you. Work in our families' lives. Lord, work in those lives of our friends, Father. Prepare their hearts, Lord, and give us the words to say it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.